Thank you. <laughs> okay. Since the meeting is also um, being recorded. I hope that's okay for everyone. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, welcome to our uh, track of the CR3 Plus uh, conference on um, responsible uh, innovation and uh, yeah, the various uh, industry and sector specific uh, um, cross cultural challenges. Um, we have a broad set of paper, quite interesting papers um, uh, from, from looking at the, the topic of sustainability, uh, responsible innovations from different angles. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I, I said we would like to start with a very short round of, of introductions and then um, uh, I say two words about the track and then we start right away. Um, so my name is, uh, I start if, if you don't mind, my name is Christian Föckbin. I'm a professor here at Odensia Business School. Um, we are co-hosting the, the CR3+, uh, especially uh, my colleague Céline Lush, uh, uh, who was there when, when this all emerged. Um, uh, the, the conference and and uh, it's a pity we can't be there in Brazil um, with most of you uh, uh, but uh, yeah we we try to make the best of it from this uh, online uh, from this online exchange or I hope we can um, my main research interest is in CSR sustainability in general uh, with a focus on responsible leadership responsible innovation basically um, Maybe can I hand over to Andreas uh, to introduce uh, to introduce himself? You are still on mute, Andreas. <laughs> Thank you. Now, yeah, hello, everybody. I'm very happy that I can join this uh, session on responsible innovation across national business systems and sectors. Um, my name is Andreas Scherer. I'm a Professor of Business Administration at the University of Zurich, and I'm particularly interested in business government interrelationship in uh, different uh, institutional settings. And especially, I explore various forms of uh, governance. And therefore, I'm particularly interested in the papers that are presented here. And I'm looking forward uh, to discuss with you. Thank you, Andreas. I would just call you in the order if that's okay for you. Uh, I see that as you um, so we don't have a um, don't lose any time. So, Alessandra, please, if you if you don't mind. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am a professor by invitation from Isai, also at Uni Curitiba, uh, the law school here in our city, and also undergrad studies in the Catholic University here, Fuki Paraná. Uh, my line of studies go with uh, ESG and also the meeting point between uh, government initiatives and private initiatives, which I think could happen toward taxes. That's what I'm going to present here today for you. Much more to put into debate rather than to present any conclusions on the matter. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Tiago, if, you, if I may. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tiago Assunção. Uh, I'm a professor of international relations at uh, Positivo University. I'm a lawyer by uh, practice, but I have been acting as an ESG consultant. And I will present about uh, ESG and the net zero commitments by private companies in Brazil. So that's my, my topic for today. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Douglas, um, sorry. Oh, unfortunately, we can't, we still can't, or at least I can't hear you. I, I, I can't hear you. Sorry for that. Now, maybe? Okay, we come back to you if, if it's okay. And we just follow up with uh, Augusta. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, I want to say it is a great honor to have this opportunity to present my work 
And I want to thank the organizers of the CR3 Plus conference and the chairs. Um, uh, I'm Augusta, I'm from Curitiba, Brazil, where I work as a lawyer, primarily in the field of data protection. Um, and as for stuff that I'm interested in, I'm interested in the interplay between law and technology, particularly technology and human rights. Thank you. Quite interesting. We have a lot of uh, uh, people with a legal background. That's that's nice. That's interesting. Uh, Eunice. Hello. Uh, Danilo, oh, good yeah, morning. Everyone. Everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm I'm here just to trying to learn something with you. It's very okay. nice to to watch your work and uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, perfect. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hello. My name is Danilo Nunes, and I'm doctor student in administration of the PUC São Paulo. Nice to meet you. My name is organization behavior. Okay. Yeah. Quite interesting. Yeah. So we have a good, good, nice kind of mix. Thank you, Sergio. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sergio. I'm a student master degree student here in Curitiba in Izai at Izai, and uh, I'm accounting. <laughs> okay. <Good>. Okay. <laughs> so another mix in the yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. yes. That might also be good for the discussions if we have these different yeah. perspectives. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, Leandro. I'm. I don't uh, see you, uh, but maybe if you want to say a few words. Leandro Ramos. Okay, uh, Cleverson Andreoli. Or sorry if I didn't pronounce your name. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I am professor at Zai, a master degree, and and I am uh, Sergio's advisor. Okay. And I want to learn something in this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Pueba. I oh, know that's probably Pueba Zoom. That's maybe not a. Participant. So Douglas, please, if I might uh, ask you again to try uh, to see if you can introduce yourself. Douglas Masari. <laughs> Unfortunately, we still can't hear you. Maybe you have to, to disconnect and reconnect sometimes the system. Even after two years or one and a half years of, of uh, Corona, we still struggle with the, the technology it happens to me as well all the time. Um, okay, so let's, let me quickly share um, <clears throat> uh, three slides as an introduction and then we start with the presentations. Um, I know we have two papers that need to be presented quite soon. So I will try to not lose too much time. Uh, now it's going again. Okay, yeah, so, so welcome to our track. Um, and uh, the idea is really why we organized this track uh, was, uh, yeah, because it, it, it builds on, on uh, a recent kind of uh, research interests of, of ours, um, uh, especially with Andreas. Uh, I'm uh, uh, doing yeah, research on responsible innovation um, for a while now, and, and we worked on a few papers there. and. Uh, what we thought it would be really a nice opportunity with the CR3 plus and the, the very, let's say diverse um, international audience uh, from, from the various, so the CR3 plus partners from the various um, continents around the world to look especially at, at, um, uh, at uh, yeah, the differences national, in, in national business systems and industry sectors uh, with regard to responsible innovation. <clears throat> So I just want to say a few words why we, we think it's important to, to look at responsible innovation in general. Um, I mean, you probably all know the sustainable development goals by now. Uh, and um, yeah, one of our assumptions or also in the, the, the scholarly and the, the public discussion is that innovation is crucial for reaching these goals, especially if you want to um yeah continue living as we do uh without lowering our standards or even maybe uh, catch up uh, or uh, improve our standards of living 
we need to do things differently, basically, uh, to still be able to maintain uh, a safe space uh, um, for for people and planet, basically. And therefore, we need to yeah innovate and and business are they're an important source of innovation that need to be uh, integrated somehow. Uh, business usually has the resources, uh, they have the knowledge, they have the technology, they have the uh, um, yeah the money and the the, the manpower. Uh, so so they can be uh, an uh, or they can be a very important source of innovation. Uh, the question then is really how to integrate business and how to motivate and facilitate um, uh, yeah, business innovation in a way that it uh, addresses sustainable development. And uh, we think that this is the way or why we think it's important to talk about responsible innovation. Uh, that is really to, to find a way to um, yeah, guide uh, business uh, innovation, uh, business in general, business innovation specifically, to uh, towards uh, the sustainable development goals or towards uh, addressing grand societal challenges. And this is in a nutshell um, what we kind of propose as a framework for responsible innovation, that it needs various governance mechanisms across uh, different levels, um, yeah, starting with the corporate governance uh, of, of the organization, the national governance, uh, international governance. Uh, um, this includes also global self-regulation and, uh, and and the various means um, of how yeah business conduct can be uh, uh, governed and also steered uh, towards innovation um, that avoids harm on the one hand, so that tries to avoid further harm to people and planet, uh, but at the same time also um, facilitating innovations by business that really specifically address uh, the grand societal challenges and propose solutions to, to some of these. Um, uh, so, so that is the idea, basically. Um, in our works, we talked about corporate governance, for instance, uh, really reflecting on more on, 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 on uh, how governance could look like. So we draw on the uh, um, uh, theories of deliberative democracy um, and, and talk about reflexive and participative governance in that regard. And we also looked at global governance and, and the role of um, corporations in, in global self-regulation in that regard. Uh, but there is much more to be done. And uh, we're, we're happy also to discuss uh, the various facets. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, uh, ESG, so, so um, reporting and, and corporate social responsibility in general uh, plays for sure uh, an important role there as well. So we will discuss that. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that uh, during this session. Uh, but also taxes and uh, how to make uh, yeah companies uh, live up to their to their uh, um, commitments and, and and their responsibility uh, is part of that um, yeah technology is an important part uh, of of um, of that discussion and how to yeah steer or use technology in the right way uh, basically uh, which is often not uh, not uh, not very much reflected upon. So this very briefly, very broadly, uh, is our idea, and this is what us, what motivated us to to propose the track. And we're happy to really have uh, you you here. Um, yeah, maybe just a final uh, pop up uh, summary. Responsible innovation, basically, we, we see that as the meta framework that uh, um, that uh, steers innovation towards avoiding harm and, and doing good. Um, we looked at some of the sector specific, uh, industry specific um, uh, differences across responsible innovation, uh, trying to think about uh, yeah, uh, the, the different implications in, in one of our um, uh, works. And this really kind of uh, led us to rethink it more broadly also across national business systems um, and, and uh, yeah, industry sectors and specifically, and therefore we are very much looking forward to, to the presentations and the, the discussions. And we can come back to that discussion uh, in the end as well, if we still have a bit of time, uh, try to, to map it out, what we discussed uh, during the, this two hour session and try to reflect on how that maybe links to, uh, to, to responsible innovation, to sustainable development uh, in general, and maybe the, the various modes of governance across uh, um, uh, organizations, across levels of analysis. Okay, so without further ado, uh, here is basically the outline of the program for today's session. Uh, so I, we did a short introduction. 
Um, we will now have paper presentations. Um, you all have been uh, advised on trying to keep it to eight minutes so that we have time for discussion. Um, I will do the timekeeping. That is, I will remind you if you are over time so that you try to please come to uh, uh, an end soon so that we have enough time for each of the presenters to, to really present their work and to have also time to discuss it. We changed the order a bit of the papers because we got um, two requests from you and I hope it's okay for the others as well. Um, paper three and four uh, as the first presenters because uh, both have um, appointments that could not be, um, yeah, that, that uh, constrain them in, 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 in the choice of when to present. And I hope that's okay for you. So we'll start with paper three and then paper four. And then in the order one, two, and five. Okay. Um, yeah, here is the, I, we, we can share the, the, the slides if you want. So uh, here is the reference to our work, uh, recent work on responsible innovation, if you are uh, by chance interested in that. Okay. So I will stop sharing the screen. Um, Andreas, anything you want to add at this point or is that, um, is that fine? Yeah, perhaps the, the time timing rules. Uh, so we have eight minutes per paper to present yes. and then 10 minutes discussion per paper. So so please eight minutes that. presentation and 10 minutes, yeah. And I will try to keep, uh, I will keep the time and remind you uh, basically when you are, uh, I, I guess I will say uh, you have uh, when you are one minute uh, when when there is one minute left, just as a kind of reminder, and then again when you are okay. Um, so yeah, please uh, paper one. Um, I know paper one. Sorry, uh, paper three, and I think that was uh, Augusta and the text. Uh, oh no, it's Alessandra. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Let me just. And then we go with Tiago and paper. Okay, now it's better. May I start? Yes, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks again for the chairs to moderating this session and for the organizers. I'll try to, I won't present all the slides so that I can be within eight minutes. So um, this is what I'm going to talk about, about sustainable tax systems. And um, I would like to let you know how I came across with the idea first. Um, as a matter of introduction, while I was studying sustainable capitalism and ESG with Berkeley, um, there was a lot of attention that was paid to the financial market and how the approach through sustainable systems and ESG is currently happening. There is a, a good involvement of corporations. We have studied the uh, B system and B corporations. And while I think this is really great and a great initiative, and while I'm not proposing at the same time any increase, please no increase in taxations here, um, I would like to discuss a little bit and us to think about how are corporations going to be, how they're going to act in this shaping of the concept of common good, which is what has to be promoted by taxes in the future, in 10 years, in 20 years. So how is this going to happen in the future? Who's going to dictate what is good or bad for certain communities? So I thought about taxes because my background comes through taxes in my master's and my um, PhD degrees. So how would we think about taxes and is this a possible meeting point between public and private initiatives. I don't have to talk about stakeholders, stakeholders and about uh, everything that's now in our hands to do where we refuse to buy, we act towards several movements that are happening in a very good way and for several good causes. So what happened? So what happens with taxes? Why are we not talking about them if we're talking and leaving perhaps the burden just for corporations in terms of acting? Uh, while I think about those and how can we implement them, I also have investigated our my own system, which is the Brazilian one, and we can find a kind of a taxation 
that really intervenes in the economic in the economy of certain sectors. So as we have, for example, we have to protect somehow the national industry in terms of development of our technology internally. So that's why every time that you purchase some technology, technology abroad and pay royalties, you have a certain taxation. And the product of that taxation is then invested in developing our own technology. So that's a way, just as an example, how taxes can act towards being more uh, aggressive into uh, promoting certain programs. And in spite of that, in Brazil, we don't have uh, much to say in terms of tax incentives, as I have had the opportunity while studying to compare, for example, with certain uh, incentives that we can find in North America, for example. Um, so my theoretical background and my studies went towards trying to analyze how corporates, corporations will act, how taxes and taxpayers can perhaps try to think about, and I'll summarize all of this into a different approach on taxation. Uh, while the uh, investment market now is looking toward ESG investments and changing, shifting the way the things are being seen, how can we start to rethink the grounds of our um, tax system in such a way we see this much more as an engagement of the parties as a tax and we see taxpayers as we see ourselves much more as tax investors rather than just payers. We have a say on the shaping of the future. I have prepared, of course, something based on financial market and there's a lot of discussion nowadays towards the purpose of corporations. Now it's a very famous quote from Larry Fink with his CEO letters, uh, letters to the CEOs every year it comes from BlackRock. And in the end, I'll talk about the criticism around all of that as well. But what I have investigated is what we are having. So what are the results of such action towards having ESG oriented policies? Uh, Susanna Papers, which is the, has promoted the greatest uh, initiatives uh, towards sustainable uh, linked bonds, issuing a billion dollars of that oriented to sustainability. BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, they have all issued letters and recommendations towards to its ESG investments. Um, Mid-2020, uh, investing in ESG had grown a lot in the US market. And we have also UN-backed principles for responsible investment, who had started in 2006 with 63 investors and committed companies committed to 6.5 trillion. And this presentation is not updated. I updated this today. For the numbers today, we have 2,700 participants and more than $100 trillion committed to um, ESG assets under management towards the principles uh, of responsible investment. So, and what about taxes here? What do we have here? We have now, uh, there is evidence that tax benefits generate engagement. I won't read those here, but they are on the paper and I can share later if you would like to see this more properly. But yes, there are a huge uh, improvement in certain investments that are uh, renewable energy and alike if we have tax incentives. So this is already there. Um, what then can, how can we then improve this with exponential growth involving much more people and much more companies and also having a new approach to the public policies towards taxation. Um, I would say, and I would advocate here that we have to act together. We have to have governments and government policies, public policies based on taxes in a way that they engage much more uh, uh, the tax payers. Um, Brazil is not a good example of that. We have more than 90 different taxes and Sergio, our accountant that's representing the account, accountants here can talk about this much better, better than I do. Uh, it is a mess, but yes, we have to rethink the system because 
corporations are taking the initiatives. Corporations are thinking about their their purposes, their re reason to be, reason to be here, and states and communities. They all have their constitutions. They all state with beautiful words the reasons to be. So why not act together and make this really a partnership in which tax payments, tax collector and taxpayer really perform a partnership in which we would advocate pay taxes, change the paradigm from burden to more an impact on taxes. I know I'm taking my time here, so I'm You're trying just, to- uh, About eight minutes, but, but please, yeah. Okay, I'll move, I'll move to the, to the conclusions here. Um, tax incentives, so have proved to be uh, and to engage long term. Uh, we need, like I said, we have to be in this together. We are in this together. Governments cannot be apart from that and just choose by their own selves while corporations cannot and, and have to let their stakeholders know what they're doing. So I have already talked about this. The engagement of investors is has grown exponentially. So I would like to see advocacy programs engaging both parties toward bringing more and more uh, tax incentives, tax credits, and tax policies towards a more uh, uh, connected and su to sustainable programs. I'll just move forward very quickly here. I would like to conclude with what I said in the beginning. There is a lot of questioning towards Larry Fink's proposal of uh, orientations to CEOs, Tarek Fancy, who used to work for BlackRock, criticism. Anyone uh, uh, reading about ESG and investors is, is aware of what I'm talking about. There are these diaries that he has published. Clara Miller criticizing them, Tarek, Fan Tarek Fancy. And finally, I would like to bring here very quickly the work from Kenneth Bucker, a professor from Tufts University in Boston. And he brings us the perspective of the financial market, but I would like to approach this to any other approach to ESG related products. So he describes as we were talking about a play in five acts. And very quickly, he says, act first, companies wake up to their responsibility. Act two, academy strides, strides, starts to create a body and discuss around the matter. Act three, where he seems to think that we are around this act three, where I think we are among one, two, and three, where ESG products are launched and uh, consultants and law firms and rating agencies, everyone thinks, hey, let's make money about this. Let's make this a very good thing. It's the ultimate win-win. Suddenly in act four, uh, we slowly recognize that certain ESG investing and as currently they are practiced, maybe they are not reaching the end of the investment purposes. So, and mostly some, and sometimes are not concerned with the planetary uh, uh, results of that. And finally, we would come to uh, Act 5, where there would be then a reawakening and a reassessment where uh, limits of investment and growing would happen together. And this he advocates that. Uh, we shouldn't expect these shifts to simply address the problem alone. And that would also have to come from citizen action, which we are seeing, but we have to increase this more and more urgent and aggressive and coordinate, coordinated government policy to change mindset and systems. So this, uh, with this, I would like to, to end because I truly believe that this is something we have to work together these are my references, and thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. Um, yeah, so uh, I could start into the discussion. Anyone already has some questions, comments for the author? I would like to, to just a little comment about the, the, the Alessandra's uh, speech. Is about the um, here in Brazil we have a, a messy environment, and uh, but I, I think the it's a very difficult to it's a, a challenge not difficult but it's a challenge to discuss urgently 
about the find the balance between the tax collector and tax payer uh, because I, I need to 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 do the the in uh, uh, this direction to find this direction and balance this uh, is not increase only the the tax but I need to we need to to show how important is this point to collect this or tax the, this point how the this uh, this uh, it's important to to make this and uh, how uh, where this uh, this money <laughs> this research the financial research will be uh, used for the society for the promote some uh, tax incentive like this the the alessandra is uh, show us i i think it's very uh, important to do this to convince the the, the person and the people to um, to engage in this this point no thank you <laughs> thank you Sergio I mean for me it was a Texas is a nice uh, and also the way you presented it uh, it, it really fits with uh, um, our idea of this of responsible innovation I just try to 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 highlight a bit because this is really one one instrument that can steer uh, um, business innovations in the in the right direction if you use it the right way but then that's the questions what are the right goals to incentivize uh, is it green energy is it uh, yeah so so that's the questions and how and also how do the uh, yeah how do the taxes work basically uh, um, are they really effective in in driving business innovation in the in the um, yeah uh, aspired direction basically so, so that would be kind of really also interesting follow-up questions that just came to my mind when i saw your presentation yeah. if i may 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 add yes, to please. your comment christian what what i uh i i totally agree with your comments with sergio comments and uh I am really concerned about in the long term certain corporations if they they have to have both uh, costs, both burdens, let's say taxes with no incentives at all, and also taking care of certain policies that should be paid originally by taxes. That those long term initiatives won't simply be able to be handled alone by corporations, and they would suddenly end. That's why I think that it would be important for us to advocate the in, more involvement, not on tax collection per se, but on either dedicating properly in a better way the, 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 the results of the collection or even, and much better, causing less burden on taxes so that corporates can commit long-term with their own ESG investments. Yeah, interesting. So, so you're thinking about the the, the, the idea of partnerships you, you evoked before. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to ask to, to Alessandra, if I may. Uh, in your research, uh, have you uh, saw something about um, the effic efficiency improvement of the, the economy through taxation uh, in terms of sustainability. For example, every, all Brazilians here in the room knows that uh, for a certain time we had a uh, weaver uh, of uh, tax for uh, automo automobile uh, purchase, right? Uh, how it was called? I can't think the name of the tax in English, but it was. Yeah, you, you, you would pay uh, less tax to buy a very popular car, right? And, and it was not attached to any uh, target, uh, environmental target. Don't you think that uh, taxation could work in, in this direction to incentivize uh, like less carbon emissions, for example? Thank you, Thiago. Thank you for your question. Yes, indeed, this is part of the research. And I can, of course, then share the paper where, where there is more data there. Um, just as an example for you, uh, if you were an, an automobile, to, to, to keep the same example that you, that, you, that you brought, industry, and you have committed to uh, net zero 
um, or as a global as a global commitment for your multinational corporation. It is it's going to be very tricky for you to produce, for example, electrical cars in Brazil because we have no tax incentive here. So that's why they're too expensive. And then industry keeps on uh, producing uh, fossil fuel uh, cars. So yes, that, that goes totally against the, the global project of any corporation. And that, that's really where I think the tax incentives should work. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the fields that we could have. Energy is definitely a place that other countries have proven to have increased uh, their performance on that towards benefits and incentives. And I think that Brazil could do a lot better in doing the same thing. Although we have done in technology, for example, through uh, CD, uh, as the, the, the social contribution of economic in, uh, intervention and have promoted some kind of protection at least for the production of uh, technology products here in Brazil. So that's a step at least. Thank you. Thank you all. I think we need to move to the next. Maybe there's one last. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, Andreas, you want to, to add uh, or have you? Do you have any anything, to, any comments maybe? Or you are still on mute again. <laughs> yeah, I had prepared a few comments that you may use for your benefit. So, um, one is that it seems to me that you have quite an optimistic view on the company engagement uh, because of course the companies um, claim that they do this on their own and that they provide public goods and they avoid harms and do good for people and planet. Uh, yet the reality is very different uh, as we often see. Uh, so, um, and, and companies also claim that they would like to bypass the state uh, because the state is inefficient. And even more so when you look at uh, fragile states of, of all sorts. Uh, so what companies want is to, to keep their taxes and give direct benefits uh, at will without democratic control, without the state. And this, uh, to some extent, is not um, accounted of in your paper at the moment. Uh, even more so, um, you do not speak much about the, the institutional context in which your arguments are embedded. And it appears that you uh, argue for the situation of uh, Brazil. Uh, but there, then, I would like to invite you to uh, fully describe uh, the situation in terms of yeah how fragile is uh, is are the state institutions in Brazil and there you could look at the fragile state index for example to have a more complete view on that. So that is one point and the the other is um, what yeah what you contribute to theory development and here. Uh, one uh, way to go would be the political economy of taxation, because this then would uh, focus on the business government relationships, uh, which are mutual relationships and how they are played out in this uh, taxation and environmental and social governance uh, field. And finally, um, I would have, um, or, or I encourage you to have a more of a systematic approach to uh, taxation uh, because you, um, there is a literature that uh, makes uh, clear categories on, on why uh, are there taxes and what, what taxes are used for and so on. And, and this um, uh, environmental social governments is only one aspect of that. And I think you need to embed that uh, with the all other functions of taxation to make your paper more compelling. So these are my comments. Okay. Um, thank you, Andreas. Uh, Alessandra, <laughs> Is it okay if you reflect on them and then we hopefully have a bit of time in the end, you could you could come back so we could move to the next uh, presentation because we're already a bit yes, over yes. time. Yes, okay. I, I would just perhaps say that I 
probably won't stay until the end. So I oh. thank you, uh, Andreas, for your comments. And definitely in the whole paper and in the final review of this, uh, uh, I could include more of the taxation approach. And definitely that was not the purpose here, not to get you all bored, including with all the tax system intricacies. But, and I perhaps won't be uh, until the end, because like I said, I'll have to leave around right, 10. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you for, for, for being here for presenting. Um, so so uh, paper, uh, I think Tiago, you are the, the next with uh, the paper for on ESG and net zero, zero emission targets. Uh, so please, the floor is yours. If you can't share the screen, I will give you the host. Um, Just I'm trying to share right now. Just a moment. Can okay, perfect. Yeah, great. All right. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'm Tiago Sonsan. As I told you in the beginning, uh, I teach international relations and I act as a, an SG consultant. Uh, my paper will talk about uh, ESG and net zero emission targets accelerating climate action through private sector voluntary commitment in Brazil. I'll, be I'll have to rush a bit because eight minutes, <laughs> I wasn't aware it was so short, short time, but I think uh, we can manage it. Well, uh, we, we start to uh, realize that climate change is the main challenge of our era and global economies thus uh, will have to speed up a major shift towards decarbonization. Financial markets have recently awakened to the need of prioritizing investments in ESG, and ESG discourse has finally gained track in Brazil, uh, also boosted by the pandemics and the green recovery uh, intention. Uh, the sixth uh, report of, uh, by EP, EPCC showed that uh, we have to act soon and urgently to, to combat climate change to reach the 1.5 limit. And uh, the, what, what comes out of, the, of it is that uh, 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 science has uh, told us that we have to arrive to 2050 with narrows, net zero emissions. So countries are doing that by uh, through their NDCs, their national determined contributions to achieve that goal. But uh, of course, we need the private sector to uh, scale up and, and to put in practice those uh, goals. Uh, so uh, we are talking here today about uh, the, 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 the transformation, the transition to a new climate economy with uh, the multiplication of carbon neutrality pledges. Uh, we have to be aware that uh, it's, it's not correct to say car zero carbon or carbon zero, carbono zero, as many people use, because uh, any activity will still emission, emit uh, carbon, but uh, to uh, reach the neutrality, right? I'll explain. Uh, so from nine, uh, 2019, many com big companies started to, to announce uh, uh, climate neutral uh, goals. Uh, and, uh, and based on different initiatives, reducing uh, emissions, using clean energy, uh, and compensated the residual emissions with carbon offset, offsets uh, through, for example, uh, carbon credits. We have many different uh, joint climate uh, uh, action initiatives, uh, which I brought in the paper. Uh, they are helping to, to boost that, uh, that goal. Uh, one of them is Climate Ambition Alliance, which was launched by the government of, of Chile and UK. Uh, uh, many countries have joined, uh, covering 7% of the emissions. Brazil did so in April this year. And uh, the problem here, which I point out, is that uh, our current uh, administration, federal administration has a serious environmental issue, a reputation issue, uh, seen as not, uh, uh, not um, trustful uh, in their actions in the area. 
Another one is Race to Zero, probably the most important global campaign in that sense, which involves non-state actors. Um, the goal is to have uh, emissions by 2030 and, and uh, reaching net zero by 2050. And more than 3,000 organizations have joined, uh, not only companies, but also regional governments and cities. Uh, business ambition for 1.5, we mean business coalition. I won't explain all of them. If not, if I, I won't have time to, for that, but you can see in the paper are different, uh, different uh, uh, initiatives on, in this direction. To set a net zero commit and, uh, commitment, uh, the company should work on three scopes. First scope is the, the emissions that the company has control uh, due to its daily activities. The second is energy, uh, and the, the third is the supply chain, right? I think you're familiar with that. Uh, so uh, companies uh, don't need to work in these three scopes at the same time uh, to begin with. That, that's uh, usually not, uh, not easy to do it. But uh, what is important here is that first you reduce, uh, then First, first you measure, then you reduce, and what you cannot reduce due to lack of technology, for example, you can compensate through carbon credits, removal projects, uh, reforestation, and, and so on. But uh, it's very important to show how and, and uh, advance short, medium terms to arrive to the net zero uh, goal uh, announced. Uh, I have uh, analyzed two com Brazilian companies with uh, net zero targets uh, here in Brazil. First one is Natu Natura. Uh, it's a cosmetic companies, uh, a cosmetics company which uses raw material from the Amazon region. They focus on biodiversity protection and sustainable use of natural resources. And as early as 2007, so uh, much in advance to any other company in Brazil, they launched the carbon neutral program uh, to reach 100% uh, carbon neutrality uh, in their products, uh, supporting 30, 38 uh, compensation projects in agroforestry and forest uh, conservation and so on. What's in interesting in this case is that uh, they, they value the emissions of the entire value chain including scope three, which is the most uh, difficult one because you're talking about your suppliers, which uh, you don't have uh, full control, but they do that uh, since the beginning. Uh, and they link the, the, the GAG, uh, the emissions uh, indicators to the profit share plan. So they, they, they pay more uh, the, 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 the managers uh, if they reach a better performance in uh, emission reduction. And what I, it's interesting, it's the methodology they use, uh, social return on investment, which uh, uh, analyze also the co-benefits uh, like community development, education, human health, and ecosystem services of all the carbon projects they invest on. The second company is Votorantin, uh, which is cement producer. Uh, the, this sector is very uh, carbon dioxide intensive. Uh, so they're trying to transform very quickly and leading carbonization efforts. Um, their goal is to become neutral by, by to, uh, to, uh, 2050. Okay, I will accelerate. So very interesting uh, that they show how they pretend to do that with technical steps and short and medium terms uh, uh, actions. Just uh, to conclude, um, COVID-19 pandemics has accelerated the awareness of managers to, to look more to the risk management. And a green recovery uh, can benefit from a preventive and proactive ESG agenda. Uh, companies who which uh, invest on that uh, gain uh, work on their reputation, uh, especially uh, with D generation, which is arriving to the market, uh, very much connected to the climate change uh, question. Um, and the, the, 
the, the development of those decarbonization strategies will require specialized professionals with uh, solid technical criteria to, to evaluate the appropriate action is taken in that scenario. Uh, credible net zero goals require more than a pledge, so practical measures and immediate action, as I told before. In fact, uh, many companies in Brazil who, which are pledging to become net zero are not showing how they intend to do that. That's why it was difficult to find to, 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 to find the companies to make the benchmark in the study, which is a very empirical study, as you can see. Uh, importance of those public campaigns and network to, to create comparison among companies and, and metrics and uh, to finalize uh, stakeholders will need to close scrutin scrutinize each company's network commitment in order to determine the credibility and push for improvements whenever necessary. That was it very quickly. Thank you very much. And I'm open to question, questions. Thank you, Tiago, uh, for, for that presentation and uh, also for introducing uh, the, the, the topic of ESG. Um, yeah, uh, and GHG, uh, yeah, ESG, um, um, disclosure and, and, and the GHG emission uh, discussion. And um, I would open the floor to, to any uh, questions or comments. <clears throat> Maybe if I, if I can start uh, right away. I, I mean, I found it interesting to see, uh, also looked at the paper, um, the various approaches uh, uh, you, you list there, uh, the various uh, um, programs and initiatives. Um, I was wondering a bit, um, did you, what was your rationale for choosing those? Are those all that are there or uh, what would be a justification for uh, focusing on those and uh, uh, over maybe other initiatives that, that companies can join and, and, and can uh, select and, and also, uh, what are really maybe a bit the the, the, the pros and cons, so the, the benefits and limitations of each of this, uh, these uh, initiatives? Uh, that, that would be kind of uh, um, an interesting question for me, basically. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. Uh, well, I, I look into the main initiatives, the main global initiatives. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and we are seeing the multiplication of them. So uh, maybe there are more, which I didn't look at, but uh, I, I, I departed from the, the, global, uh, the global scenario. And uh, one, of the, one of them that I look with very much interest is race, race to zero, because it involves uh, not like companies, but also regional governments and cities, for example, here in Brazil, uh, the, government of, the government of Mato Grosso, which is in the Amazon region, most of it, uh, has announced that they are uh, uh, joining Race to Zero, and, and it has the United Nations support, so it's very uh, solid, as uh, even methodologically mm -hmm. speaking. Uh, another, another one, the climate, um, what, which is the name? Um, uh, climate Action 100 Plus uh, is interesting because they gather the, the, the 100 most, uh, the biggest em emitters, uh, like the, the, the most intensive uh, uh, companies on uh, GHG emissions. And now are, they are already in 170 or something, uh, which is, it, it accounts for a, a large portion of the industrial emissions. So that's important mm -hmm. also. So I think they are kind of com complementary, you know, like there's in the government level, there's in the non-government level and also the private sector. I tried to be representative of all of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that. Yeah, thank you for, for, for that, uh, for these clarifications as well. I mean, I, I think they're all quite quite interesting and, and promising or, or even not, but I guess also just for the sake of the development of the paper, uh, if let's say, your research question is which initiatives, uh, let's assume, uh, is best in uh, reducing or is most efficient or, or uh, legitimate maybe also as, a, as an initi initiative in, in, in reducing uh, 
uh, GHG emissions or in, 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 in fostering climate action. Um, I think it could be could be interesting to uh, find a rationale for why you chose one over the others and then try to dig deeper into basically the uh, yeah, the limitations that they have, be it in terms of the, um, uh, yeah, the participating parties, are they inclusive there? Uh, are, what, what is the governance of, of these initiatives and, and how do they uh, try to drive change basically? And, and how do they verify what companies uh, report? So, so it could be, could be nice to have a closer look uh, at, at those and, and either focus on, on the most promising one and look at that in really more detail or do a comparison of the, 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 the benefits and limitations. Uh, I think that could be a, a, a nice follow-up for, for your paper as well. Uh, Great. Thank you very much for your remarks, Christian. Anyone else wants to um, add a comment or a question? Okay, seems more or less uh, we are fine. You you have anything to to add or you something you want to maybe um, yeah put as a question into the room? <clears throat> Andrea, Andrea, want to talk? Sorry. Okay, please. Yeah. Uh, oh no no <laughs> no. Uh, your your mic was open, so I thought. No, I was just going to add, Christian. Um, the, the focus of my paper was to show how the ESG discourse has been boosted by the, the climate change, uh, uh, you know, uh, right. discussion or discussion, and also how does those net zero commitments have been pushing forward the, the private private sector, right? Like mm. they, they are taking the lead in Brazil, and 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 I would like to emphasize in in the lack of governmental action, you know, like we. Right. we it's calamity <laughs> environmental yeah. area in Brazil now. So that's, uh, I, I think I see with good eyes that the big companies are making their group their part, you know, in that. Mm. Yeah, and it's interesting to, to see that and, and that they step up. Uh, I mean, there is this ongoing discussion about uh, soft law and hard law. I mean, uh, it's uh, business self-regulation enough and, and how can we incentivize it and how can we make it work and and what is the uh, how much regulation does it need to to make it really efficient um, but I think this is really an important aspect that could contribute to this discussion so you you could maybe also try to link it to, to that to a certain extent if you say for instance in the Brazilian context government isn't doing a lot so it's companies we see companies stepping up and and joining these initiatives and uh, uh, yeah, it could be could, could be nice to analyze that. Uh, uh, yeah, interesting. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so I would um, hand over to the third presentation. I think we have uh, Augusta and uh, the paper on regulating smart cities. Please. <clears throat> Hello again, guys. Uh, good morning. And thanks again for the opportunity. I'm really excited to have this chance to present my work. Okay. So regulating smart cities, it is really hard to discuss this subject in such a short time, but I will give it my best shot. So I define a smart city as a city where technology is embedded in urban services and infrastructure. And smart cities, they are presented by scholars, but I think especially by the ICT industry as a way to tackle social inequalities, crime, climate change, among other issues. And I think that this is a very strategic subject for developing countries like Brazil, because they are the ones that are most affected by these issues. So when we think of smart cities, we usually think of technologies such as big data, IOT, artificial intelligence. But today I want to discuss especially algorithmic decision-making. 
So very briefly, the theoretical background for this work were in, was interdisciplinary and comparative legal research works that shed a light on the interplay between technology and regulation and the methodology was desktop research. Moving on to the results, um, there are benefits to the adoption of smart city technologies. So I mentioned algorithmic decision-making. What is algorith algorithmic decision-making? It is when algorithms assist and even progressively replace human beings in administration and decision-making. And I think this is a good thing in principle because human judgment is subjective and it, and it is prone to errors and to corruption. And algorithms, on the other hand, they are objective and they rely on large amounts of data and applied mathematics to reach decisions and make predictions. So in a sense, you can say that algorithmic decision-making is more evidence-based or even more scientific than human judgment. Uh, so um, I think public administration has, there is this poten potential that public, public administration will become more efficient and fair uh, with a growing use of algorithmic decision making. However, I always like to make the point that technology is not neutral. And this is a lesson from the book Code by Lawrence Lessig. He says that um, technology is imbued with political, social, aesthetic values. So in other words, technology is strongly influenced by the biases of the people or company who designed it. So I will give you an example. When you visit a website, there is a certain web design architecture that determines what you can do on that website. And they, and they didn't ask for your opinion when they, when, you, when they were building that website, but you are still subjected to their decisions anyway. And I think this applies to all technology. So these design choices, they have very concrete and practical consequences. And I think this must be the big take home lesson for any legal scholars. Uh, regulation must target the creation phases of a technology because design choices must be subject to democratic oversight. So how does this issue arise in the context of smart cities? There is a big push for cities to modernize themselves, but I think it is very hard to distinguish the legitimate push for technological progress from a promotion of corporate agendas. And I say that because worldwide, there are only a handful of companies that provide smart city technologies like uh, IBM, Intel, Cisco, SAP, Siemens, um, and in practice, these few companies, they act as obligatory checkpoints for any local governments that wishes to modernize their cities. So um, in legal terms, it means that the contractual arrangements are very disadvantageous to public actors as they have less bargaining power. And as a result, and this brings me back to my previous point, the design choices in the context of the development of smart city technologies, they are not subject to democratic oversight and regulation must target this. So um, my final point was trying to propose a regulatory strategy for one smart city technology. And again, I picked algorithmic decision-making because it is a technology that particularly needs democratic oversight. Uh, especially when it is used in the field of criminal justice, because algorithmic decision making can have a very big impact on people's rights and freedoms. So when public administration uses algorithmic decision making, this raises many challenges from the point of view of administrative law, because traditionally the public sector is bound by duties of transparency and accountability. The problem with that is that some algorithms are black boxes in the sense that it is impossible to exhibit the reasoning 
behind an algorithmic decision. But it is possible to reach an acceptable degree of transparency if the records associated with the design process are shown to society. The problem is that those few ICT companies, usually they resort to trade claims of trade secrecy and they abuse these protections, conferring them an overly broad interpretation that prevents society from having access to any meaningful information whatsoever. So uh, I propose that data protection law must be interpreted in a way that uh, counters this issue. So both in the European and in the Brazilian data protection legislations, um, individuals are granted the right to meaningful information about the parameters used in a system of automated decision-making. So in this instance, data protection law expands on procedural rights that are traditionally granted by administrative law. So when citizens exercise their data subject rights, they can help assess the fairness and efficiency of a system of algorithmic, algorithmic decision-making. So to conclude, I think that the interplay between data protection and the administrative legal frameworks can help modernize those older, more traditional legal frameworks. And the reason I say that is, Data protection, especially the European law, the GDPR, they are considered to be technologically neutral legislations. What that means is that the lawmakers, they knew that usually the law cannot keep up with the pace of technological development. So these legislations, they were made with this in mind. So um, as a legal professional, who is very interested in the interplay between technology and regulation, I welcome the enactment of data protection legislations because they, offers, they offer strategies to counterbalance the powerful lobby exerted by ICT companies in order to protect administrative legal frameworks and the democratic values that they represent. So these are my references and um, that is all for today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Perfect, thanks a lot and really um, well on time. Uh, okay, thank you for that uh, presentation. Any, any reactions, any comments? Uh, may I? Yeah, please. Augusta, congratulations. I think your approach was amazing to, to the topic. Um, I, I think it's more a comment than a question, but please, you're the expert here, so uh, let me know if the comment makes any sense. It is, uh, for me at least, it's the first time that I see someone tackling the issue of uh, the virtual environment and the social issues uh, connected to um, artificial intelligence. So for me, it makes sense to see your topic together with ESG, because you're proposing governance in a, in a, in a new environmental, uh, uh, in a new environment and in a new social interaction. Did I understand correctly? Yes, that's exactly it. Um, I intended to highlight the challenges that arise when governments and companies with increasing use of artificial intelligence and particular, particularly algorithmic decision-making. So I think it definitely raises uh, challenges also from a governance point of view. So yes, that's, that's exactly it. If I can uh, compliment, it's about the accountability. It's uh, necessary to accountability. And Augusta, what's perfect, I, I very interested in your presentation, congratulations. And I think this point is about the um, uh, accountability and you make a, a expression, a black box. You know, it's uh, incredible this. It's very difficult to access this information about the black box, black box inside the companies like Facebook or Meta now and the other companies, uh, giant companies here. Uh, we will face this point together now. Thank you. <laughs>
Yes, yeah. this is a huge issue. The black box is a very, very big issue because um, you cannot separate black box, uh, the black box aspect of this technology. This technology is a black box by nature. So uh, there is no way to have technology without having black boxes. Um, and yes, it raises many challenges uh, because usually when a person reaches a decision, they can explain their reasoning for it. And this can be used to hold them accountable, but the algorithm can't do that. So it is very complicated. Okay, anyone else, and Andreas maybe? Yeah. Yeah, I found this uh, paper very interesting and a very timely uh, topic. Um, so uh, um, I think you are going in the right direction and you emphasize um, the problems that come with this new technology. Um, we have a, a few recommendations on what you may, may look at. Um, at some point you emphasized that these smart cities, that there are variations on whether, let's say, cities uh, collaborate with tech companies in different forms and who is in the driver's seat of that. I think that is a very important um, issue. And uh, I, I remember that uh, Shoshana Zuboff in her, in her book on uh, surveillance capitalism has devoted uh, uh, some space on that and I realized that you did not reference her so maybe this um, you, you could um, look at her work um, because I think she's very strong in emphasizing the, the problems uh, and you go obviously one step further because you also think about the uh, possible solutions. And uh, I have another book that you may consider or another discourse that is from the University of Frankfurt, this uh, research uh, uh, initiative that is called Normative Orders uh, that was, is uh, initially initiated by former uh, students of Jürgen Habermas, but um, they have uh, cross collaboration through many uh, disciplines and they also uh, have a good um, chapter in it by Klaus Günther, who is a former PhD student of Habermas, but a trained uh, legal scholar and a professor of uh, legal studies at the University of Frankfurt. And he has a paper in it that is called titled From Normative to Smart Orders. And he elaborates also on, on smart cities. And, and his argument, which I found very compelling, is that he said that, um, that this, uh, what you emphasized in the beginning of your paper, that uh, artificial intelligence is very strong with technocratic problems. That means finding the best uh, means for given ends, but uh, artificial intelligence is very weak in defining the ends or changing the ends. Uh, and therefore what we need is some sort of uh, collective and democratic decision-making process, which in a way uh, artificial intelligence and smart cities uh, sidestep. So the, uh, or, or potentially sidestep uh, because the, the goals of the whole system are in, in, installed by those who erect it. And if it is these private firms like Google or others uh, who do these uh, collaborations with cities, then their goal is to make money and not to, to make the, the citizens in the city well off. Uh, and and there is a, a the danger that you emphasize and uh, Klaus Günther um, discusses some ways out on a governance level so that how yet democracy can still be installed in such systems. So you may look for his work and I, um, yeah and and other than that I think it's, it's a very good project, very interesting. 
Maybe Andreas, just as a, a comment on that, can you maybe put the name or the reference even into the chat that, that yeah. uh, I can find? Yeah, the, I mean, it, the, the whole book is in German, but uh, many mm, of okay. the authors and also Klaus uh, Günther also publishes in also in English. So. <coughs> put it in the chat, yes. Mm. Yeah, I think really the challenge is that for me, I think uh, yeah, algorithms uh, uh, um, or AI, they cannot define the mean. So they're not only bad at it, but they can't. Someone has to 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 program them towards an end. Uh, you know, is it if, is it the YouTube algorithm that is programmed towards maximizing uh, um, uh, uh, yeah the time stayed on the channel? Uh, then this is the goal, and then uh, yeah, the algorithm learns how to uh, reach that goal most effectively. And this might mean then that it distorts the uh, that it that you get. Um, the next video you get to be shown or recommended that is recommended to you is, is a bit more decisive, a bit more uh, catchy than the previous one, and, and this might have negative implication. Um, so I think it's really the goals that, that need to be uh, thought through quite uh, well in advance, ideally in a de democratic uh, process, and then uh, it needs to be uh, uh, monitored what uh, the AI does with that and, and, and uh, yeah, what the implications are um, uh, in, in trying to find the most efficient means towards those goals. Yeah. So I think that's, that's quite an interesting discussion. Yeah. Anyone else? Any final comments? <clears throat> If not, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Augusta. And uh, I would suggest we move to the next paper. So now we have, um, it's originally called paper two, the Simplified Sustainability Report um, by, let me uh, quickly check, um, by Andreu. Is that correct? Um, it's me, Christian, Sergio. <laughs> ah, Sergio, sorry. Yeah. I was just, I have uh, somehow not found the name. So no sorry. problem, no but, problem. But, but perfect. Uh, Sergio, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. I would like to share my my screen here. Yes, because I try it. If not, let me know. <clears throat> uh, okay, thank you. And uh, could you confirm is it's, uh, ah, yes, I, it's, it show me now. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we see it, yeah. Yeah, just have to start the presentation mode. Uh, yes, it's my turn. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to participate in this CR3 conference. I'd like to thank the for Isai and the professor Clever Clever Sandrioli to support me to develop this subject and paper. And uh, our our uh, subject is about the simplified sustainability report. Uh, selected sustainable sustainable practices for uh, direct. Hey, sorry, Sergio. I, I know. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Maybe can you also do it in a presentation mode so that that it's a bit bigger for us to see it. Uh, you ah, know. Um, the, sorry. Sorry. You are not I, yet. Uh, so you have to. I think. Uh, okay. Sorry. I try again. Okay. No. It, it's just you. You shared the right presentation. I think you just have to click on. Presentation or presentation. Yeah, perfect. Now it yes, works. Yeah. Yes, I, I chose the the the, the wrong uh, way. Okay, perfect. and um, I my uh, our paper is about the simplified sustainability report selected uh, sustainable practices specific for specific for small and medium sized enterprise or e, uh, SMEs, the abbreviation, and. Uh, First of all, uh, our paper uh, seeks uh, contribute to the adoption of the sustainable practices by small and medium-sized enterprises uh, through a, a simplified sustainable report. These, uh, these entities have an important role in the economy and social, particularly, particularly in developing countries like Brazil. However, uh, they need to handle with the, the lack of financial and human resources um, they are under pressure because of the grow, growing demand from stakeholders, some stakeholders, and uh, requirements to participate in the supply chains of the large multinational corporations. And the, some challenges of the SME owners are uh, identify and in, in, implement the sustainable practices 
that uh, will make the best use of scarce uh, research, researches, transform them into actions and initiatives that are recognized as uh, sustainable by society, while also uh, maintain the, the legitimacy and continue, continuity of their businesses. Uh, therefore, the objective of this study was propose, to propose a simplified sustainable report that may be adapted to the reality of these SMEs uh, based on the structure of the Global Report Initiative Standards, or GRIs, and the social environmental responsibility questionnaires used by uh, Brazilian financial institutions. Uh, and uh, we, uh, based on main points in the theoretical backgrounds, such as relevance of this matter to Latin American countries uh, and global south, uh, we have a, a reduced number of the art articles related to this. Uh, the researches were used by uh, using a keyword selected at uh, Cielo and Web of Science journal portals, and the totaling uh, 54 uh, articles to, uh, about this point. Uh, we have the information as asymmetry, uh, asymmetry impacts in the SMEs, difficult to apply the GRI standards for SMEs, even been the most sustainability report used in the world, according to a survey by KPM, KPMG Consulting. Uh, and also we have the social environmental uh, responsibility questionnaires used by financial institution uh, to, together with the stakeholder theory and the theory of stakeholder salience. Um, when the, the uh, talk about the methods, uh, we apply a uh, qualitative approach and a uh, descriptive uh, research to identify the Brazilian SMEs to adopt the re uh, reporting of GRI standards in Brazil and in consulting to, uh, we consult in the GRI uh, sustainability disclosure database uh, where they find uh, totaling 16 Brazilian SMEs using the GRI standards analyze the questionnaires of financial institutions because uh, now uh, I think the, the talk, uh, we talk about this, uh, Alessandra talk about be it's better and uh, Thiago too. Uh, investor, investors now consider climate risk as an investment risk with the consequent impact of the global uh, system, global financial system that fi finances economic growth. Uh, the results about the, this two analysis result in a, obtain we converted in a binary code to disclosure them, the practice. Here we have the, uh, the phases, we organize the, the, the research in three phases. Phase one, basically the focus was investigate and most frequent the GRI standards adopted by the 16 uh, Brazilian SMEs. And selected in the uh, selected in the GRI's sustainability disclosure dat database. In phase two, uh, it was analyzed the most frequent questions in the questionnaires of financial institution. In total, was uh, six uh, institutions selected. And uh, finally, the uh, phase three compilation of the results ob obtained in phase one and phase two. After uh, here is a, a, a brief about the the results about the the first fa phase. Uh, uh, we have the uh, 23 um, indicators, sustainability indicators by FRS standards, and we have the 17 question, questions uh, collected by the questionnaires about the Brazilian institution, uh, financial institution. This is the, our results. Uh, and the findings specific, specifically about the, um, the GRI standards, uh, we have the results show us a greater frequency of uh, selected indicators uh, from the, the book called in the GRI standards, like uh, university standards, around the 56%. None of the 16 Brazilian ESIMs adopted all the 23 
uh, indicator selected. The greatest number was one, just one SMEs adopted uh, 20 indicators. In the other hand, we have uh, the other hand who has uh, one SME with 10 indicators. We also noted that the SMEs adopted more qualitative than quantitative in indicators. Um, probably uh, the, the, this uh, select was because uh, the qualitative not requires significant uh, effort to apply them. Re in the, the other side, he, um, they re reinforce the legitimacy of SMEs uh, operation with stakeholders and the highlights to image and reputation as sustainable uh, entities and to manage stakeholders' pressure on, the, on their operations. Uh, and about the, the findings, oh, sorry, here. It's about the findings about, uh, about the, sorry, about the questionnaire's findings, the, we found 17 questions in common between the questionnaires, the Brazilian Institu financial institu institu institutions, sorry. And the subject of this, these questions is not included in GRI standards. And uh, just only four of these questions was present in all questionnaires. It just the, we have a difference uh, approach around the, the financial institutions uh, as well. To co concluding our, our paper, uh, this simplified sustainability report is based, based on current practices uh, adopted by Brazilian SMEs, uh, reporting the GRI standards. Our expectation is to help owners to select a sustainable practice to balance the reality of their, their enterprises, uh, reinforce the legitimacy of SMEs operations, management the, and the communication to, st uh, to stakeholders uh, this point, this practice, help to reach uh, sustainable developed goals and the, the uh, SG, uh, SDGs, and to balance the economic, social, and the environmental interest of the Brazilian society about this point, like uh, uh, accountability, like uh, as a, a comment before. <laughs> It's, uh, we have here the reference used for the paper and I'd like to thank you for listening now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any um, comments or questions? Yes, I, find, I found Sergio's work uh, very interesting. Usually when we talk about sustainability, we address uh, corporations, bigger businesses. So uh, I, I haven't seen many, many works on, on that topic before. And what I really wish uh, is that uh, sustainability could be a competitive advantage. Uh, do you think that would be possible somehow, Sergio? Yes, Augusto, thank you for a for question. Uh, I think yes, and uh, the next step of this uh, paper, uh, our research is applying in the, in the field work, and uh, some results about this point is yes, some uh, SMEs, uh, uh, I think this is import important to advantage, advantages in the, in the market, but uh, I think the, sorry, uh, Alexander is not here more, but uh, the point is there's some uh, incentives to, to apply with more effect effectiveness. For example, maybe the tax in incentive or maybe the more uh, uh, awareness about this uh, involve the, the customers. Uh, in, in the other side, we have the, the uh, pre preparing the consumer about this, like the culture. But yes, I think it's very important it's necessary to involve the SMEs because it's very important, uh, like in, here in Brazil, for example, after the pandem pandemic, we need to uh, restart the economy and the SMEs is very important for our economy in general, uh, just to, not just the, 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 the economy, but you need to more 
generate the empl employees and the, the our the, uh, social uh, engagement here. Very, very good, your questions, your question. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I fully agree with uh, Augusta. I think it's an interesting focus uh, because we, um, like she said, we, we have a lot of research on multinational corporations, big corporations, but uh, still not much on um, SMEs. Uh, there is a, a literature there, an emerging or an existing and, and, and also uh, uh, an emerging literature, but, but it's still, um, not much. Uh, I mean, yeah. what you could do uh, as a suggestion is really pick up on that a bit more even. Uh, um, so for instance, Laura Spence does a lot on that. And I think you, you cite uh, also one of her papers uh, that's also, I think, even co-authored with Andreas. Uh, and uh, for instance, also Christopher Wickert. <clears throat> so they, they really try to, to, to look a bit at the differences between, uh, yeah, what why size matters, basically. Uh, um, what is different in SMEs compared to to, to &Es and 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 how that uh, influences uh, their way of engaging with uh, sustainability, uh, be it reporting or 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 really the initiatives. I think one of their main points is that um, <clears throat> for MEs, for the big corporations, it's easier to talk about sustainability than to implement things because that's much more costly. If you have to really restructure a big business, uh, while it's the other way around for SMEs, uh, often uh, um, it's much more costly to 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 talk about because that would require maybe hiring one more person, which is a uh, really a, 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 a big cost factor for very small companies. Um, but but doing things, it's often easier because yeah, if the especially if the uh, owner um, uh, is is committed to it uh, because then uh, yeah you can change uh, you are more flexible more adaptable um, but but building on that that could be interesting and and really engaging a bit more with that literature that might also give you some some additional some additional ideas I guess. thank you Christian <laughs> thank for observations anyone else has something yeah. Geraldine. Hi, hi. hi, Sergio Geraldine from hi, Australia. I'm sorry, I've only just come on fairly late um, this evening. It's uh, around about 12.33 a.m. for us here. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering whether in your, um, your qualitative um, data analysis that you've uncovered any motivations for the SMEs to report on sustainability initiatives. Um, as one point. And the other is to kind of build on what Christian was saying, do they discuss the, the resource implications for, um, for either reporting or for putting these kind of sustainability initiatives together? Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, Geraldine. Uh, yes, it's an important this point in the res resources and the, it's about the some uh, specific characteristics between the the small the large companies and the small companies and uh, i think the the first uh, maybe the main the, the, the principally and uh, it's about the um, the owner it's very near of the the operation and he decided or she decided uh, uh, how the the the, the company um, will be de developed the 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 ethical the culture the involve the engagement about this point, and uh, in my uh, researches recently, uh, I, I I received uh, just seven uh, answers about our uh, um, my questionnaires about this point, but I I re read the questionnaires is very interesting the 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 points about the owners, uh, owners or manager the the, the responsible person in, about in in the companies. But uh, I saw the engagement about this point. They, they have a, a duty, very uh, uh, important duty in this point. They try to uh, spread around the, the organization this point. Uh, in the other hand, we have some uh, small companies. Uh, they don't have the, this uh, conscience about this yet. 
for example, uh, just a, a little uh, example, I have a uh, answer by because the pandemic was uh, I was make the made the the uh, uh, research by phone, and uh, one uh, company uh, answered me like ah, I, I would like to not participate in this uh, uh, research because it's very small. Just uh, ten peop people here is very small. It's not. A, for us <laughs> and uh it's it's a very it need to change the the mindset about this everyone is important uh, here in brazil because the we have this uh economic uh abysm in this point is very important the small companies for our company uh for for um, uh, economy sorry and uh it, all everyone is important for for in their understand this point and apply for for us and the, the uh, change the mindset about the the sustainability yeah. uh, i mean that will be another interesting part to explore too what are the actual characteristics um, or behaviors of the act of the owners or the individuals in those more senior capacity um, in those smas that makes that happen so that we can learn you know, from, from their responsible leadership or sustainable leadership um, yeah. to, to, I guess, to, yeah. to talk about those uh, Im implications or contributions that other um, SMAs might be able to put into place based on those um, SMAs. I mean, they could be great mentors as well for other organisations uh, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. But thank you, um, really interesting research. And, it, and like um, uh, Augusta, I like the fact that you have um, focused on SMEs. I, most of my research is actually embedded in startups in business incubators. Um, and for the same reason, it's kind of looking at that. Often the corporations are studied, but we don't necessarily study some of the, um, the behaviors and passion um, and success mm. indicators of you know, smaller startups within, you know, either incubators or SMEs. But thank you. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you all for your comments. Uh, at this point, I'm happy to say uh, hello to Guy, our third co-convener who was able to join us now. Um, uh, so, so welcome, so well, Guy, for the yes, last I, time. Yes, I apologize time. again because there was a change to my teaching schedule and I, I couldn't be present during this part of the session. So my apologies to all of you. I just, uh, yeah, I informed everyone beforehand and then now happy to, to see you there for the last, uh, just in time, I wanted to say for the last presentation. So I uh, would just uh, already um, hand over to, to paper number five, social responsibility and organizational uh, commitment. Um, and uh, yeah, Danilo, I think uh, that, that's, that's your part. Um, so please feel, feel free to share your screen and, and start. Okay, good morning. It's an honor to participate in this event and contribute to evolution of prop systems. Uh, the theme proposed is social responsibility and the organization commitment and the hotel industry, the moderating role of your organization culture. Uh, the research was done with employees of several hotels in Portugal. The authors of this article are Dr. José Gonçalves das Neves and Dr. Patric Ana Patricia Duarte and Master Vitória Sanchez Chagas for uh, Business School of Instituto Universitário de Lisboa. Uh, and I, Danilo Nunes, and the, the Dr. Neuza Maria Bastos Santos, uh, PUC São Paulo, Pontifício Universitário Católica de São Paulo. Uh, an organization is not a guidance only by the economic goal of wealth creation, but also by social and remote and values, recognizing how its actions involve and have an effect of the community, create a culture of responsibility and Different areas. 
Uh, according to Turkey, social responsibility in organizations has a decisive role in the increase of collaborations commitment. The organization commitment is the link, the connection uh, developed between the individual and the, their companies. Being considered as a fundamental dimension of organization life, according to Pierre, Havan, Amado, and Belenger. Otherwise, the organizations have been uh, facing recurring challenges and the chances where their adaptation and success depend on the organization culture in this perspective. The studies of organization culture has been reason of huge interest because it is allowed to structure the company's practice with the values shared by workers and manage their organization behavior and identification of individual with the organization. The main purpose of this study is to analyze the relationship between them, perception of social responsibility practices and affective competence uh, simultaneously uh, testing the moderating effects that the types of organization cultura, clan, hierarchy, market, and advocacy cultures can exert of this relationship. Main references present in this suit are Chen proposed that the culture in the result of complex group learning process and some existing groups are incapable to develop a culture. It's necessary to accumulate experiences from a common past to create a set of shared assumptions. Culture is not something that is shared, but is also something profound, invisible, intangible, and inconsciently felt. Mayer and Allen proposed the three component conceptation of organization commitments. The following components are affective, instrumental, and normative. The authors believe that the individual with a strong affective commitment stay at the organization because they want. The ones who have an instrumental commitment stay because they need it. And those who have a normative commitment feel obliged to stay. King and Hobart presented the existence of two key dimensions in the conception of your organization effectiveness, which, when positioned as two axes and overlapping each other, result in a spatial model constituted by four qualities, serving as base structures of the QPT value model. Uh, based on considerations uh, extending of literature and answering the main problem of the study, the following hypothesis were made. Hypothesis one, uh, the perception of corporate responsibility practices is positively related to affective commitment. Hypothesis two, the relationship of the perception of corporate social responsibility practices with the affective commitment is moderated by the organization cultures of to a advocacy, to b clan, to c market, to d hierarchy. In order to investigate the levels of affective commitment, Perception of cultural and corporate social responsibility practices adopted in organization that simply use the consistency of several employers who work in different companies in the hotel sector operating in the Western region of mainland Portugal. The type of sample used in distinguished by a no probabilistic sample for convenience. The research approved about it was a quantitative model, and the date survey was carried out with questionnaires prepared 
uh, with great scales, né? provisions, tests, and validated in Portugal, in order to ensure a greater scientific rigor in the results on the students. The social responsibility variable was approached, it was a predictor variable using the grade developed by Duarte. A general indicator of social responsibility was used to bring together all dimensions simultaneously. The organization committee was discussed as criterion variable using the mayor and the other grade uh, adapted for Nascimento and Salgueiro. The organization culture was deal with us moderating grade and the instrument used was the grade adapted Mavis. On variable was created for each of the four typologies studied. Results. The correlation, the correlation analysis of using experiments correlation coefficients evidence that our variable presented in the investigation social model are positively associated with other. The perception of social responsibility practice is moderately associated with the four cultures types. Adocracia, Ken, Market, and Iraq. The social responsibility presents a significant association with affective commitment. In reference of the affective commitment, it's present a positive correlation with the four types of organization culture. Although this association is more significant with the clan and adocracy cultures. The, percep the perception of the predominance of clan culture demonstrates a direct effect over the affective commitment. Com 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 uh, conclusion. The, the, the results demonstrate that the workers' perception have about the social responsibility practice adopted by the company has a direct and significant effect in their affective commitment. It can be seen that greater the perception of social responsibility practice, the more employers feel committed and linked. Therefore, the first hypothesis which suggests that the perception of social responsibility is possibly related to affective commitment was corroborated. The perception of culture promotes a greater affective commitment, suggesting that this is a factor that derives and results for organization culture. It was verified that culture is perception of an advocacy, clan, and market does not practice a moderating role in the relationship between the perception of social responsibility practices and the affective commitment. Thus, rejecting the hypothesis to A, to B, and to C. However, it was found that hypothesis to D was valid as it predicted that the relationship of corporate social responsibility practice with affective commitment is moderated by the perception of a hierarchy culture. There are our main references with emphasis in Mayer and the Allen, King and the Horhauberg, Egresh, a third. So now in Portuguese, eh, vou procurar e seguir o, o roteiro estabelecido, né, que era preferencialmente a apresentação no idioma inglês, de respeito até a todos os participantes, mas vocês fatalmente perceberam né, que a comunicação oral é uma, a comunicação oral na língua inglesa é uma das minhas fragilidades, né? Então eu abuso agora da, da indelicadeza, mas o, o abusando também da gentileza, 
né? que essa parte de, de conversação ela se pode ser feita em português, para que não haja nenhuma interrupção né? no, no questionamento ou nas perguntas que venham surgir, e que eu também essa interrupção não venha, é, é, venha refletir na possível resposta minha, para que haja uma, uma quebra na interrupção do, do entendimento do, do estudo. Então, agradeço gentilmente se isso puder acontecer, ou se algum colega, todos os colegas até agora apresentaram o domínio perfeito na língua, né? se pudessem é, é, ajudar na produção. Bom, sorry, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Also, I did not understand what, the, what you said in the um for the last part but i guess we have a, a big audience of, of portuguese speaking um uh um, yeah participants including one of our co-conveners so Jerm <laughs> would be able to to respond to, to what you what you said um yeah thank you for the, for the interesting paper are there any um, uh, direct comments questions uh, for the author at this point yeah Please so speak. christian if i may take on from here because yes, I, I was the one assigned to read and comment on the work of Danilo and co-authors. And I will, I will just make very brief uh, comments. And perhaps, Danilo, if so you wish, se você quiser, a gente pode depois conversar mais uh, longamente também. But, but, but just to be very brief, I, I'm commenting on the text that I read, so not on the presentation. And I adopt a bit of the perspective of a uh, reviewer, supposing that he would send the paper to be published uh, somewhere, yeah, and then my 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 suggestions to try to improve this study that is a red, a complete study in the sense of having data collection completed, the hypothesis set, and the results uh, uh, disclosed would be basically five points. Yes, so the the first point is that there is a need of uh, polishing the text so that things are going to be a bit more clear in terms of uh, reducing some repetition. And, uh, and perhaps the point number two, I think that more explanation is needed on the rationale, on the reason why uh, culture would be considered as a moderated variable among these two other effects that you were measuring. So we're just, that's just about the writing of, of, of that. Uh, the one point that I could not really understand the reason is why uh, culture is included in your, in your modeling as a typology of different cultures, uh, mostly because uh, the dominant form of trying to look at culture in organization studies that are quantitative is by looking at the cultural dimensions. Uh, so I was just curious about what is the reason why a typology has been the preferred way of doing it. Uh, then uh, uh, I believe that during the, the review of literature, there are some elements specifically about CSR that are not really needed to build the argument that you build and that uh, some passages could be eliminated from the paper, uh, making it more concise and allowing the reader to understand it better what is the central line of, uh, of argument. And the two last uh, comments that I would have that are kind of minor, the one is that uh, the results in particular from page nine on uh, they could also be presented in the form of a table, so that would be easier for us to understand it quicker than uh, as text. Uh, I agree with comments made before about uh, the literature needed to be a bit updated. In particular, sometimes uh, three times uh, in a row, uh, you quoting someone who referred to someone else. And on this case, it would be good if you could go to, directly to the, to the original uh, reference. And, uh, and that's it, and that's it. There is one phrase, and that's a very minor thing, but there is one phrase, and you even put that on your presentation as well. And I, I was asking myself if there was a mistake on the way that it was copied from the original source, when it said that uh, culture is not something that is shared, but is also something that, and there we go. So my question is that if the original would not be Culture is not only something that is shared, but it is also something that. So I just asking myself if there was a word missing there. And that's it. Yeah, thank you, B, for, for these comments. Daniel, do you want to respond or shall we collect the 
other responses? Uh, Azevedo, eu creio que entendi um pouco da tua interpretação, né? da tua inquietação, mas agradeço a proposta de, da continuidade de papo, é, da, da, dessa continuidade de diálogo, mas é, pontualmente, né? a, tua, a tua pergunta final agora, a tua inquietação final, é, você poderia fazer em português, por favor? Ah, pra claro. Ver, entendi, só só para ver se eu entendi. Ah, muito simples. É, eu fiquei com a impressão de que essa frase... Que, foi, que você usou tanto no texto como na apresentação, é, que talvez tá, esteja faltando uma palavra, quando aparece é, co cultura, não é alguma coisa que é, é partilhada, mas também é alguma coisa que é profunda, invisível. Eu só estava me perguntando se não está faltando uh, culture is not only something that is shared, but it's also... É só verificar se a, a referência inicial não foi... É, alterada na hora de escrever. Perfeito, perfeito. Então, era, é o que eu tenho entendido mesmo. Eu acredito que sim, viu, Azevedo? Agora, tá você bom. falando, para mim, fica mais claro, né? É no sentido de... de é, uma, é um conceito de Chen, né? que ele fala que, a, a, resumindo, né? É, a cultura é mais do que compartilhada. A cultura é mais é, do que compartilhada. É, Exatamente, é mais é, do que é, compartilhada, é, mas é, é compartilhada, né? Ela é compartilhada, ela, assim, ele reforça que o sentido de compartilhamento da cultura ele faz sentido quando houver percepção disso, de fato. Mas é mais Perfeito. do que compartilhado. Perfeito. Obrigado aí pela, pela observação. Né? Ok, thank you very much. Uh, might I ask you please to unshare the screen so we can see each other for the last two minutes if there are any kind of uh, general uh, comments, questions or discussions that we want to share. <coughs> So yeah, thank you all for, for, for the interesting presentations. I think we had a good, a nice mix. Uh, so looking at the, the topics from the various different angles, and I think it all links nicely to the discussion of uh, responsible innovation. So can we uh, either bring companies to innovate uh, towards more sustainability uh, or yeah, uh, what are the different uh, uh, means and facilitating uh, um, ways of, of doing that uh, yeah being it by by uh, looking at the tax system by looking at disclosure ESG disclosure of different company sizes uh, being it through um, yeah uh, looking at, at technological innovations AI uh, um, uh, or even uh, yeah by, by looking at employees I think that's also important um, uh, in this last uh, uh, part. Uh, uh, maybe I can take over the. Uh, maybe I can. Yeah, I I can't take over the. Uh, or stop sharing. Um, uh, now maybe like this. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I I was able to manage. So please, everyone, anyone, uh, any last comments, anything you want to share, any questions you want to ask? <clears throat> I think it was, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, first, late first, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. So we have Augusta, Sergio, and then Andreas, I think. Um, I want to thank, the chairs again and the organizers of the CR3 Plus conference. I thought this was very interesting. Uh, there are many ways to address responsible innovation. And I think the presenters displayed this very clearly because each one of us had a different perspective on the subject. And um, speaking for myself, uh, I had a moment of uh, growth and development here this, this morning. It's morning in Brazil, so it was a very interesting moment for me. And uh, it was amazing. So a big thanks to everyone involved. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Sergio, you, you want to? Oh, I, I would like to thank you for, for your moderation, Christian, Andreas, the, the comments in general. I, I, I... I, I think it's very help, help to support us with the over, overall uh, outside the, our research. It's very refreshes to about this. 
and uh, Guilherme <laughs> in the, the last part was very important to, to help us. Danilo is very good to, to help them. And uh, the other presenters, the, the Augusta, Alessandra, and Thiago together, thank, Danilo together. Thank you very much for, for this moment. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, the time didn't allow us to, to even dig deeper, but, uh, but I think uh, it was already a nice kind of uh, mix we had and, and some insights we could gain. Andreas, you wanted to add something as well? Or, sorry, and then you maybe. Because I think, Andreas, didn't you at some point raise your hand? Maybe no. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, I, know, I don't know who was first, but but Ernest. Uh, I just want to, to give uh, congratulations to you all and wish you good luck on your research and everything. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I, I love it to, to hear you all and uh, uh, to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. No, I have nothing to add. I just thank you for, for, for running it. It has been wonderful for us as well to receive the initial proposals and to be able to see the advancement of the different pieces over time. Uh, a, a, a very, a very uh, uh, fulfilling experience from our, from our end as well. Mm. Uh, for me, it was a challenging moment. Uh, Congratulations, eh? congratulations for organization. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, th thank you again for your contributions for the discussions. And I think we're already two minutes over time and, and the program is continuing. So we guess we won't keep you any longer, um, but, but yeah, thanks again uh, uh, for submitting your, your, your work to our uh, track and for presenting it and having these kind of interesting, really interesting discussions here. Um, so yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference and hope to see you at, uh, at, at some point again. Uh, thank you very much. Bye, bye everyone. <laughs> bye. <laughs>